Good evening, everyone. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, my fans, my fans, why? <laughs> I'm Waja, I'm Valentine Joroge's sister, and <laughs> And today I'll talk to you about an experience I went through last year. Good job, babe! Niaroka! That was my husband yelling at the top of his lungs as our daughter was being born. And to think, <laughs> and to think he's the quiet one. It had been a grueling 22 hours of labor. I'd come in from work at about 10.30 p.m., labored from 1.30 to 1.30 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. that night. And it all happened from the comfort of our two-bedroom apartment. Yes, that's right, I delivered my baby at home. It was quite an experience. I was surrounded by my loved ones. My brother brought us food. We sang, we danced, we prayed. I cursed, <laughs> asked for forgiveness. But in that day, our life changed forever. I'm not telling you this story to impress you. So don't think that I'm some kind of extraordinary woman. I'm an ordinary Kenyan woman. I eat nyama choma with my hands, I'm a member of a chama, and I drive a Toyota. <laughs> so don't start making excuses, <laughs> thinking that I'm special and we can't all be like Waja. No. So where did it all begin? Well, my husband and I, we jumped into bed and, okay, fine, maybe I won't go that far back. But in January, when I discovered I was pregnant, I, dis I did what any self-respecting new age mom would do. I descended upon Google. Baby center chat rooms, YouTube videos, midwife blogs, you name it, any cyberspace rock, I turned it upside down. In my research, I, found, I stumbled upon a documentary by Ricky Lake called The Business of Being Born. In this documentary, they talk about the steps that women are taken through as they're delivering their baby that inevitably lead up to cesarean section. And as I watched this video, it began to resonate. I realized that a lot of my friends and relatives had been taken through the same conveyor belt. Step one, when the woman, when the woman comes in for her first antenatal, tell her to put her feet up, relax, eat whatever you want. Because your husband or your boyfriend should be your errand boy. Sounds familiar? <laughs> Step two, when she comes in to deliver, do as many vaginal exams as possible. Make her nice and tense so that she doesn't open up the way she's supposed to. Step three, introduce the drugs, epidural, pitocin, pain relief, induction. These things don't follow the the, what your body is supposed to go through naturally. So of course your body is in distress. And finally, step four, you hear the infamous words, the baby is in distress, mtoto amechoka, we have to operate. Sounds familiar? So as I watched this, I realized that a lot of women think that they're doing what's best for the baby, when in fact they're actually just doing what's best for the hospital's bottom line. As I watched this video, there it was. <laughs> Two seconds later, that voice, you know the voice of self-doubt? That voice crept in. Ah, you think you can deliver your baby at home? Yes, yes, yes. I can, and I will. <laughs> How will you convince your husband? You'll probably get some quack online. <laughs> I can't do this. Then. Shut up, I said I will deliver my baby at home. In this process, I learned three key life lessons. The first life lesson was that having a crystal clear decision makes it easy for you to convince others to do exactly what you want, because you know exactly what you want. My first hurdle was convincing my, my husband. He is an African husband. I am an African wife. I know this is a wild idea. I can't just come up to him and say, I will deliver my baby at home. 
Of course, I know, you know, I have to take him slowly. The story has to start from miles away. So I started, oh, you know, remember she calls cesarean section. It was so unnecessary. And delivering a baby in hospital, it's so dangerous because it's true, it is dangerous. Hospitals are where sick people go. Hospitals are where people go to die. I'm not sick. Why should I go to hospital? Eventually, he came around, hence the yelling, good job, babe. <laughs> Second life lesson was that a crystal clear decision helps you to move against adversaries. When people try and convince you against something that you are convicted about, you have your decision to hold on to. I remember my husband was having a conversation with his mom, and she asked him where we're delivering the baby. When he told her we're delivering the baby at home, she didn't skip a beat. <laughs> Loosely translated, that means, are you too insane? I understood our parents' apprehension. They looked at us and saw people who were undoing what they had worked so hard to move against, to move against infant mortality, poverty, backward traditions. So I understood. They were looking at their well-educated children, making a decision that they thought was irresponsible, reckless, <laughs> as my mom nods, <laughs> and reckless. But in making my crystal clear decision, I was able to move ahead even as they told me to stop doing what I was doing. I remember on the day, on the delivery day, my mother-in-law showed up at home at 8 a.m. You should have seen the look on her face, the dread on her face. I tried to be a good hostess, but when labor got real, I just said, Kwaheri, and went to the bedroom. There was so much drama on that day. My uncle, for, for instance, called and was asking, what's the problem? If it's the money, just say. <laughs> We will pay. Just go to hospital. <laughs> third life decision, a third life lesson. By making this crystal clear decision, I was able to uncover layers of strength that I did not know that I had. I was telling you the story to impress you. I'm telling you the story to impress upon you the power that you hold within yourself. When you believe in the decisions that you make, when you believe in yourself. To quote an American poet called Ella Wheeler Wilcox, she said, let me read so that I do not mess up her quote because it is beautiful. There is no chance, no destiny, no fate that can circumvent or hinder or control the firm resolve of a determined soul. Thank you.